Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Greater Houston Business Procurement Forum's monthly event. Uh, this is a networking, matchmaking event and forum, uh, now a webinar, uh, but for the last um, 29 years uh, was an actual event that we hosted, I guess, for the most part at Houston Community College. Uh, so we're just very, very pleased uh, to bring this event to the community. Uh, we're fortunate uh, this month to have a lot of our federal agencies. In fact, the theme is doing business with our federal agencies and of course, navigating the maze of federal contracting. You know, it's not easy to, to do business with the federal government, uh, but there's some, there's some tools uh, to, that you really need to know. And, and as I see it, when I look at the panel today, uh, we've got the best that I know there is. Certainly in the Houston area, I think in the state and maybe in the country for that matter. Uh, and you'll note that as you hear from each one of the panelists. Uh, with that, we also try to bring a strategic partner uh, with us uh, that has been a, a great supporter of ours and us of them. Uh, and in this case, uh, this month, we have uh, Abel Gonzalez, uh, and of course, Abel is uh, with NAMAC, the National Association of Minority Contractors, and uh, Abel has, um, and NAMAC just had their Day of the Construction Worker. Uh, they had it out at the uh, Houston Raceway uh, Park, and um, and we, uh, you know, it was just this past Saturday, outstanding event. We had a uh, a number of general contractors there. We heard from the Northeast Water Purification Plant. That's the big uh, plant at Lake Houston uh, that we're going from 80 million gallons of purified water per day to 320 million gallons a day. So uh, I think I just saw Abel uh, and here he comes. Uh, Abel, um, just tell us a little bit. It's so good to see you, man. So great to see you. Uh, after after a tough week, huh? Uh, a tough <laughs> week of diversity. So this past week, guys, was diversity and inclusion week. Uh, so a number of general contractors, Abel and I, went to a number wow. of GCs uh, to uh, hear from them uh, and talk about opportunities. And of course, uh, the week culminated uh, with Abel and NAMAX event, uh, the day of the construction work, as I just mentioned. So just to kind of give us a quick recap of the day of the construction worker and all the great things that NAMAC is doing uh, in this city uh, to bring contractors together with GCs, real opportunities for our minority contractors. Abel Gonzalez, Executive Director, I'm sorry, Garcia, Executive Director, National Association of Minority Contractors. Abel. Thank you, Milton, and thank you to your audience. As always, I'm always happy to be here with you. I'm always happy every day because there's so many wonderful things happening in construction and in NAMAC. Uh, we did have, thank you. By the way, I had Mr. Construction open our Daily Construction Worker 21 at a phenomenal place at the racetrack, at the racetrack, Houston uh, racetrack on Bell 8 and 249. Phenomenal place. We gave some wonderful awards. We dedicated, however, this particular event to the 22 families that lost you know, their their workers, their brothers, their, their, their sons, their husbands in 2020. It's a serious business and we, NAMAC, are going to be the voice from this point forward to any fallen construction worker. And so we started with that and we awarded, made many awards. We gave Luis Spinola, mm -hmm. the uh, Company of the Year mm -hmm. on Safety, yeah. and also a Lifetime Award on Safety. He started this day of the construction worker 17 years ago, Melton. Wow. He is, you know, eats, Absolutely. breathes, sleeps, uh, safety. Uh, we also gave an award to our proud uh, host here to MCA as a company of the year in NAMAC because because of MCA, we were able to do many, many online um, events mm -hmm. and uh, we would have been nowhere without them. Uh, so we gave many awards. We had probably 350, 400 people come through. What a wonderful event. We had more food than we could possibly <laughs> eat. We had mariachis, we had live music and so forth. Uh, I couldn't I couldn't be at a better place, Milton, with with MCA because we're having such a great 
uh, turnout and such a great opportunity in representing our small businesses, men and women. I'm so excited. If I wasn't me, I'd want to be me or I'd want to be you. <laughs> I smile every day when I wake up. What a great place to be, yeah. Construction. So Milton, thank you so much for allowing us a few minutes. Uh, yes, we're always excited to help you because you always help us. And, and if you're out there, wake up sm smiling every morning and say, what can I do different than I didn't do yesterday? What can I do? Wash my truck, clean my tools, you know, wear a new uniform, new hat like I have. Uh, so, so take heart and take all the business you can take. Milton, you man. thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, man. And uh, Abel, Abel uh, couldn't have said it any better. Uh, and uh, and our thanks always uh, as we've been putting on this forum webinar, I guess for maybe almost 20 months now, when I think about the last webinar or the last actual forum we had was in February uh, of 2020 uh, at HCC, Houston Community College. And, uh, you know, he has and NAMAC has continued to fill voids uh, where we've needed them to be filled, in particular in the National Association uh, and the Minority Contractors Group. Uh, so he's just done a phenomenal job. And MCA, as he mentioned, uh, has just been a great, great organization. One of the top audiovisual techno technology firms uh, in the in the country. And uh, and I guess you know, in saying technology and automation and innovation and audiovisual and all of that good stuff that kind of helps me and kind of segues me into our first presenter. Uh, and, uh, and that is Andrea Odom. And Andrea is with Impact Strategic Consulting. Uh, and she's, um, the team uh, is part of the ION, uh, the capital I, small O, N. So it's, it's not a, uh, we were thinking, Andrea, that it that it was it always stood for something. Those those three letters, uh, but but more than that, I know that um, you're going to speak, but you also have a video that you wanted to share with us that really talks about what is the ion, what it's all about. So with that, Andrea Odom, Impact Strategic Consulting. Andrea. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us, Milton. Um, we love to partner with you and join your organization. You're such a special part of the community, so we appreciate you having us on today. And yes, Milton, um, we will show the video first, and then I will just give a quick overview of the ION. The video is going to cover a lot of it. We do have an event that's coming up tomorrow. Um, we are at full capacity. However, we have created a walk-up registration opportunity, so we will be going over what's available at that event tomorrow after the video. While you're queuing that up, I'll give a little bit of overview of what our role is on the project. So the ION district is a multi-phase project that is housed in the former Sears building. For many Houstonians, you guys are familiar with where that is. And as people have watched that take shape over the years, um, there's the video. I'll pick back up after you play that, Aaron. Innovation. It's the big ideas that solve some of the world's greatest problems. With every innovation, there's a starting point, a spark that ignites. What if there was a collaborative complex where these ideas could be made into a reality, a home where the brightest minds could collaborate, where startup opportunities could be fostered? This is the Ion District, Houston's innovation community, a new kind of urban district to Houston, prioritizing street life, public space, and a mix of uses that embrace technology, community, art, and sustainability. Born in a city that's no stranger to innovation. Heck, we've been to the moon, and we're not stopping there. We've created a space housing game changers of every size, sector, and skill level who are looking to amplify their influence on the world economic stage and deliver a better quality of life for each other. We are innovators. Innovators of all types. We are trailblazers. We are thought leaders. Homegrown and across the globe. We are focused on community. A community working together. To help each other. Connected by bold ideas. Today's innovators solving tomorrow's problems. Big moves and small wonders. Cultivating opportunities that create a better future for all. We're breaking the mold of what a tech entrepreneur, big business, or investor has to look like. It's time to roll up our sleeves and get to work. Let's dream it. Let's build it. Right here, 
and now. All right, thank you for that, Aaron. And as you guys can see, and you may have seen some familiar faces, while the ION is a tech hub, it is a part of the community. There are meeting spaces, training room spaces. There are corporations that have chosen to set up their office here. It will also be mixed use when the multiple phases are complete, mixed use residential. We will be doing a, par a parking garage that's coming up on the next phase of construction. We also have five anchor restaurants that will be on the ground floor, and we are excited to announce that our diversity team had a hand in bringing Lucille's in, and they will open a second location here. It will be called late August. Um, we have a couple of other minority restaurants that are in the pipeline as well. So we're really excited about what's taking place here. And so with that, Milton, do you have any questions for our team? Um, yes, and, and thank you so much. This, this was uh, just um, an outstanding presentation and we're so excited about uh, the district itself. Uh, can you tell us, I think we mentioned that there's some $15 million, I guess, in contract opportunities upcoming. Uh, yes. So maybe the, can you share, I guess that includes construction, uh, concrete, underground yeah, utilities. Yeah, there's a blend. There's about 20 different scopes that we're going to go into more specifically in detail tomorrow at our industry day. Um, everything from engineering to masonry, um, doors, pavers, concrete work, electrical. Um, and then we also have a section that will be under non-construction. So Transwestern, who is our partner that does the building management, um, will frequently reach out to our diversity team to look for an MBE, DBE, window washers, floral design, interior design, um, several different things, uh, cable hanging, all kind of different things that we need throughout the year. So the 15 million that we're releasing coming up, that's scheduled RFPs that come out. But then it's also good to come in and meet with all of our staff because as opportunities arise, they will come to us and say, hey, which vendors might you guys recommend? And from the event and our attendees, we're creating a list. And guys, it, you know, just so you have a, a sense of, of, again, where all of this is going on, this whole stretch is what I call it. It uh, is, 16 acres. Stretch from the Astrodome or NRG uh, all the way into the Medical Center where we've got a $5.2 billion expansion of TMC3 uh, going on. Um, into the zoo. We just did a hundred million dollar renovation of the zoo into the museum district. Um, we just finished the Museum of Fine Arts. That was a 200 million dollar expansion and now into into ION and that innovation technology district. I think Andre is it what 14 blocks or it uh, is it's a total of 16 acres and it's rolling out in four phases and the ultimate goal is to have this as a promenade type mixed use um, living working eating dining collaborating technology hub and to have it all right here in midtown well we're excited so tell us again when when's the date so Maybe. industry day, our industry day event is tomorrow. It's going to be from four to six. So because our event did reach capacity, we now have kind of opened it up to a list. If you're planning on arriving, we will have a walk in registration. Um, we recommend that you arrive early because right now we've got about 140 people confirmed. And so we're really excited about having a building full to see this new space. We're going to do a quick opening. We'll show the video. We'll explain the breakout groups. Then you'll move out with Gilbane and they'll do their one on one breakout groups while they'll break down the different scopes of the $15 million. For those who are non-construction, we'll have them move downstairs into the Transwestern breakout group. There will be tours, and then we'll conclude with a reception in the open forum. And this is oh, 4201 Main is the ION address, and it's going to be from 4 to 6. Outstanding, Andrea. We're excited, and I will be there. I promise I'm you that. I'm going to be looking for you at 345. Arrive early. Right. Thank you so much, Andrea, for all Thank the great information. And guys, please don't miss this event. There's still time, as Andre is saying, to walk in. Uh, there's too many opportunities. There's too much going on in the ION district. Thanks, and Andre. As the diversity Thanks. team, that's one of the things that we're happy to be partnering with RMC as the diversity team. And our job is to continue to foster those relationships and make sure that uh, the firms like the ones that your organization represents have a seat at the table and have first dibs on these new opportunities. Outstanding. Okay. Thank Thanks you so guys much. So much. We'll see you tomorrow. See you okay. Bye-bye. All righty.
that, that is a great, uh, really excited about, about this project and, uh, and one that we really need to be able to take advantage of, guys. Uh, there's a lot of construction uh, and, and other stuff, as she mentioned, you know, uh, there's um, architectural, a little, maybe a little bit of architectural engineering, uh, but just a number of areas, material supplies, uh, maybe janitorial, building maintenance. So uh, we need to be aware. With that, I want to go into the crux of our program, and that is, again, doing business with the federal government. Uh, I'd like to first present Valerie J. Coleman. And Valerie is a program manager, Prime Contracts Program, Office of Procurement Contracting, U.S. Small Business Administration. Uh, I'm very pleased. I, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with Valerie. Well, I won't say it, Valerie, but, but for many years, many years. Uh, as far as I say, I think she's the guru of federal contracting in, for me in this country. Uh, she's got 48 years of experience with federal contracting. Uh, I love the way she she pushes folks. She pushes the, the, the big contractors who have contracts with the federal government, the GCs, the primes that have contracts with the federal government to do more, to adhere to federal and minority um, uh, SDB, DBE standards. Uh, so we really appreciate her. She was, uh, and, and as far again as I'm concerned, has always been one of our top advocates of the year. Just a few years ago, she received uh, that award, uh, the Advocate of the Year. So I'll, I'll continue to talk. I think it's better for Valerie. And let me just set the tone with that. Valerie is going to speak. Uh, she's got a nice piece she does on the do's and don'ts of federal contracting. And guys, you got to listen to her on this. This is very important. Uh, but, but once she finishes, uh, her presentation, then she will then in turn, in order, introduce the rest of the pa the panelists uh, from the federal agencies. So with that, Valerie Coleman. Valerie? Yeah, thank you, Milton. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you're with us. And this is, I think, our 10th or 11th year of doing um, the Greater Houston Procurement Forum Breakfast and introducing those of you who have never been introduced to federal contracting, um, I always tell people that if you if you can if you can remember one word when you're working with the federal government, and, th and that word starts with a P and it's called patience. Uh, we are not known to move real quick, um, and so even in these days since about February of last year. Um, things have still been moving uh, just because we are not physically at our desks are on location at our offices. It doesn't mean that things stopped and I can definitely say that about SBA um, with our uh, PPP and IDLE loans um, helping out individuals because of COVID and everything else. Government contracting has not stopped. I don't have our final figures, but I, I believe the last I saw, which was last week, uh, we have exceeded what we've done in the past, working with um, or getting contracts awarded to small businesses. And so we want to just keep on moving that number up and up. And when we when we look at working with small businesses, we're also talking about our socioeconomic groups, which is our small disadvantaged businesses, um, service disabled, veteran owned small businesses, hub zone, not to be confused with state of Texas hub, hub zone, federal hub zone certified um, firms, and now certified women owned and economically disadvantaged women owned small businesses. And so we're constantly looking for new work. And Milton has talked about the do's and the don'ts, and, and I've presented that numerous times. And the do's and don'ts have changed just a little bit because of COVID. Uh, we're not able to go in and, you know, call and make that appointment and go in and sit down with someone face to face. Hopefully it will not be too much longer uh, before we're able to, to do that again. Uh, but 
I wanted to talk about some of the do's and don'ts that are really important right now because we're still doing this basically in a virtual world. Um, and so it, when we're doing it in a virtual world, that means there's more email traffic than normal. Uh, a lot of times we could pick up the phone, but the phone numbers that are a lot of times listed on websites are the office numbers. And unless you forwarded them to a personal um, cell phone or an office cell phone, uh, those numbers are just going uh, into that office phone or you're getting a recording that says that they can't take any more messages. So um, I know that I work just from my cell phone only, um, not any office phone, and I much prefer emails as I believe most federal employees do. That is the easiest way to get a hold of us. But our email traffic has increased a thousand fold uh, because of that. And so that's where the big word with the patients comes in, where you might be able to hear something back from someone in a day, maybe two days. It's going to maybe take four or five days before you hear back. And so work with the patients. Um, I, we taught that to our son when he was little, when he was fishing and he didn't catch anything in the first two minutes. And we were like, it's patience, son. You just, you've just got to relax and take it easy and know what's going to happen. I uh, just can't tell you, you know, when it's going to happen. So um, I always tell people too, that if you want to talk to someone, you know, give us a call. If we haven't returned your phone call in a couple of days, send us an email. Uh, like I said, emails are the most important right now to us. The easiest way to get a to get a hold of us, unless you have someone's personal cell number. Um, so send us an email. And with that, I'm just going to share my screen. Let me see how I can do this. There we go. Uh, I'm going to share my window and pull this up. There you go. Hope everyone can see that. That is my direct information, my direct phone number. Of course, that's my SBA cell phone. That is my direct email. There's a couple of things I want to talk to you about that you may want to write me an email and, and request the information. And so that's what we're going to be talking about right now. Um, one of the things that is really, really important is that you register on the databases. Um, we have what's called SAM.gov, System for Award Management.gov. Everyone, large or small business, has to be registered in SAM because that's how we find out about your bank routing information because we don't pay by check. We directly deposit and have for years and years and years. So you have to be in SAM, not necessarily to bid on government work, but you got to be in SAM if you want to be awarded the work and then, of course, get paid for it. So it's very important that you that you're in SAM. With that, if you are in SAM and based on the information that you submit um, and you show up to be a small business, you will be hot linked over to or when you get to the end, you will see SBA's logo and you will hot link over to SBA's dynamic small business search. Um, we found out that about 90 to 95 percent of the individuals are so happy they got into SAM.gov um, and got accepted that they forgot to hot link over. And so their profile is not fully complete. And that hurts you a whole lot because if you're not showing capabilities, if you're not showing keywords, if you're not showing references, a lot of times the contracting officer is just going to delete you because your profile is not complete. So to make sure that you're doing everything that you're doing, my big suggestion is if you don't want to send me your information is you're going to be hearing from our procurement technical assistance center at the end of a, the panel discussion and i'm not going to step on tim's toes but it, i will just say this if you want to do any kind of government contracting whether it be federal city or state and you meet their requirements because they do have requirements now to become a client um you are missing out on a whole, whole lot. So I'm I'm just going to put in my um, two cents and encourage everyone to be 
uh, a client of the P-Tax. And so uh, that's all I'll say, Tim, because I, I don't want to take away your, your thunder at the end. Um, another thing is you must have a capability statement. And we're talking about a one page. This is a big do, a one page capability statement, front page only. A couple of things on your capability statement if you don't know how to do one. Again, the PTAC can assist you, but I also have a blog on how you can put together a capability statement. You can send me an email um, at this email address on screen and ask for it. Um, there's a couple of things. If your logo on your capability statement is more than a fourth of your page, it is way too big. I would say even more than a fifth of the page. Uh, we want to know about your company, not what your logo looks like. And so uh, be aware of that. You also may want to do a template so that you can change up the information in there, depending on whether you're talking to a federal prime contractor or a federal agency or a state agency or a city government or the Port Authority or a large prime like Gilbane that was mentioned earlier. So having a template where you can just cut and paste and enter information is a is a big, big do on that. Um, also, uh, just to let you know, because I'm not going to take up a whole lot of the time because I you, there's so many people that you really need to talk with. Um, SBA has uh, the Office of Government Contracting. We have come up with our 2021 edition of a guide to doing business with the federal government. Uh, it is a wonderful guide. It's, it's been um, put together by all of our area offices. We have six in the country um, out of uh, Boston, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Chicago, Fort Worth, and San Francisco. Uh, all of our air directors had input into that. It will not only show you the 12 steps on how to do business with the federal government, but it's going to give you other SBA resources such as uh, information on how to get certified by the federal government, how to um, go if you want loan information, how to get an SBA loan. All of that information is in there. It also gives you general contract resources, then gives you a listing of current laws and regulations and where you can find those. And then all of the OSDEBU offices, which is the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. These are this is this is your small business point of contact. It will give you their office. Now, one of the things I do want to say about that is then when you're calling into that office or you click on that link, you don't want to talk to the OSDEBU. The OSDEBU is not going to be the one that's going to be able to assist you. Um, for example, um, if you're if you go to NASA's OSDEBU. Um, web link, you don't want to talk to the people up in headquarters. You want to talk to, if you're in Houston, you want to talk to the local Houston folks because they're going to be able to tell you what Johnson Space Center has. Or if you're, um, you know, down in the southern part in Alabama, Mississippi, maybe you want to talk to the people in Stennis. So the Ozdaboo is a great way to get to the points of contact that you need. So when you click on that link, Look for your local points of contact because they're going to be able to help you a whole lot. If you'd like that guide, and it's about 25 pages now, you can send an email to me and you don't have to write anything except put in the subject line um, federal government guide or SBA guide, and I know what you want, and I'll be more than happy to send it out to you. To now, so that you can learn more about what SBA offers. Um, and some of our resources, I'd like to introduce Ida Benson, who is a business opportunity specialist with the local SBA Houston District Office. Ida? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, give me one second. I have a short PowerPoint I'm going to upload as well. Okay, good morning. Good morning and again. My name is Ida Benson. I'm a business opportunity specialist with the Small Business Administration, and I'm just going to be covering uh, a little bit about the services that the Small Business Administration offers small businesses. 
So uh, my name is Ida Benson. I'm a business opportunity specialist. My email address is ida.benson at sba.gov. If you have any additional questions after we wrap up today, please feel free to give me a call or email um, and contact me. So the federal government actually has a, a contracting goal of 23% of all federal federal purchases should be set aside for small businesses as much as possible. So um, there's actually a goal and we make a great effort to uh, for small businesses to, to contract with the federal government. So a little bit about getting started with federal contracting. If you if you currently do not contract with the federal government, there are a few things that you need to do before you start uh, bidding on contracts. And one of those is you want to research your next codes and your next codes describe what you do as uh, a small business and what industry you perform and sell services and goods. You also want to request your Duns number. That's Duns and Brad Street number. It's a nine-digit number that is similar to your Social Security number, but it is assigned to your business. And as Valerie mentioned earlier, you want to make sure you are registered in the SAM database. SAM.gov is where all companies, uh, no matter the size, are registered that want to do business with the federal government. It is also how you get paid, so you want to be really careful about your login information. And again, Always contact PTAC if you're, if you're already an established business. Uh, PTAC is a great resource for small businesses in the area. Once you have done that, you want to use SAM.gov also to search for federal opportunities. Um, you will also see industry days listed there and advertised also. So you want to make sure you uh, check SAM.gov for contracting opportunities. As well, you can also do market research there for uh, previously awarded contracts. So you can do market research um, through SAM as well. And then you want to contact small business specialists with the federal agencies. These these small business specialists can also assist you as a small business with figuring out that federal contracting maze and, and marketing to the federal agencies. And of course, you always want to make sure you market, market, market. So the SBA has several different uh, programs to assist with contracting. We have certification programs. We have the 8A program. We have the Hub Zone uh, Historically Unutilized Business Zone program. We have the Women Owned Small Business program. We also have the Mentor Protege program that is open to all small businesses and a joint venture program, which is a contracting um, program. It has a contracting aspect to the program. And then we have SANJ training that's available to all small businesses also. If you're interested in getting on, uh, seeing the monthly schedule for the SANJ training, you can always log in. Uh, you can actually go to sba.gov and fill out the information to become, uh, get on the contact list. And the Houston District Office will send out this, um, this SANJ training monthly. And then we have a surety bond program. So surety bonding is a program, is a lending program actually for businesses who require bonding that you may have difficulty getting that bonding out uh, independently. The SB has a program that can help you with that. And so first off, do you have to get certified to do business with the federal government? And the answer is no. You can self-certify yourself as a small business, a small disadvantaged business, a veteran-owned small business, or a services-able veteran-owned small business by completing your registration at SAM.gov. So a little bit about our certification programs. First, we have the 8A program. It's a one-time certification uh, that is nine years. You must be the majority owner, 51% or more individual. Uh, you must be an American citizen by birth or naturalization. Your business must be minority owned and controlled and managed by a, by a socially and economically disadvantaged individual. You must control and manage the firm on a full-time basis and meet the SBA requirement for disadvantaged by providing both social disadvantage and economically disadvantaged information. You must be you must be a small business, of course, in business and operating for two years or more, and also demonstrate a potential for success and show good characters. And these are just a brief overview for the 8A program. 
the women owned small business program again something that's a little bit different about the WOSB program is that not all next codes are included with this program so you want to make sure you visit sba.gov to search and make sure your next codes are included with this program and it must be 51 percent unconditionally and directly owned by a woman uh, you must be a U.S. or naturalized citizen, manage the day-to-day -day operations of the company, also make the long-term decisions for the business, and hold the highest position in the company. The woman must also work full-time in the business doing normal working hours. And this program does not require you to be in business any minimum amount of time. And our last certification program is the HUBZone program. You must recertify for this program annually. You also must be, of course, a small business, 51% or more controlled and owned by a U.S. naturalized citizen. But you also must be located in historically underutilized business zone, as well as 35% of your employees. So to find this out, you can actually go to sba.gov forward slash HUBZone, and you can check the map. You must input your address for this program. You can't just look at the map because it's really difficult um, to just look at the map and determine whether or not you're in a hub zone. And also your employees don't necessarily need to live in the same hub zone, but they do need to live in a hub zone. So you would also have to input their addresses as well. And lastly, the, the SBA has several resource partners that can help you completely free of charge with either developing uh, your business, starting your business, or uh, expanding your business. So we have SCORE, PTAC, the Small Business Development Center, as well as the Women Owned Business Center. Uh, Milton, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I'm so happy to join you all, and that is all I have for you today. Thank you. Valerie? All right, thank you very much, Ida. Now we're going to get into our panel, and what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce all of our panel members, and this will be in the order that they'll present. They each have between five and seven minutes to talk to you about their agency, and um, and then when we get to the end, it'll turn back over to me, and, and uh, we'll go from there. So our first panelist will be Jerry Bird, and Jerry is a small business advocate, uh, with the Small Business Development Branch with the Federal Aviation Administration in Fort Worth, Texas. Next will be Mark King, who is a Customer Service Director with the General Services Administration, or GSA. After that, we have our very own Monica Kraft. We say that because she used to work for SBA, um, who is a Small Business Specialist at Johnson Space Center, so she works with NASA. Fourth will be Kay Ripplinger Baltz, who's the deputy of the small business programs with the Department of the Army, the Galveston District Corps of Engineers. After that, Lakeisha Douglas, who is the branch chief purchasing and contracting with the Department of Veterans Affairs here in Houston. And then we have Tony Arps, who's the project director with the Depart U.S. Department of Transportation. And then we will end our panel with Timothy Scarborough, who's the program director at the University of Houston's Procurement Technical Assistance Center, or PTAC, that you've heard a lot about already. This is a great panel of federal agencies. Please pay attention. They're going to give you some wonderful information. And Jerry, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Valerie. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, very good. Well, I have a presentation here for you today. And as Valerie mentioned, I am Jerry Bird. I am one of the advocates for the Federal Aviation Administration located in Fort Worth, Texas. And Valerie can, there we go, there we go. So everyone can see that, I hope. Um, a little bit about the FAA is that the FAA in its current form was created in 1966, and we are one of the sub-agencies under the, Fed, under the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation, along with the Federal Red Railroad Administration and the Federal Highway Administration, among others. If you look at this chart <clears throat> here, the FAA, you'll see that the FAA is divided into three service areas, the Central, Eastern, and Western. <clears throat> the Western service area, 
hub is in Seattle or Des Moines, Washington. The central uh, hub is in Fort Worth and the eastern hub is in Atlanta or College Park, Georgia. We have other major buying offices at our headquarters in Washington, D.C. And then our two centers, one in Atlantic City, our tech center, and in Oklahoma City, our aeronautical center. We have other buyers located in Boston, Jamaica, New York, Des Plaines, Illinois, Chicago area, and LA. One of the big things to know about doing business with the FAA is that we are not under the federal acquisition regulation, the FAR. We have our own regulation called the acquisition management system, which is similar but more streamlined. This chart shows you the goals we have for FY22. And although the FAA does not fall under the Small Business Act, we do have our own goals that we maintain. Um, for FY22, we also have an, a hub zone goal that's in progress, <clears throat> but it's not shown here. And we're working on a separate goal for small disadvantaged business that is not 8A. FAA has regularly met its goals in recent years and continually strives to improve every year. Another something that's different about doing business with the FAA is that you, if you are a service disabled veteran owned small business, we do require that you be verified by the VA in order to do business with you as such. So we will check the VetBiz database prior to making an award to make sure that you are registered if so. The FAA buys everything to support the National Aerospace System or the NASH. We buy construction, services, and supply projects, which are mainly procured in our service areas. We buy construction, such things as HVAC, electrical, roofing, fire life safety, <clears throat> as well as new facilities and maintenance of all aspects of existing facilities. For services, we have janitorial, groundskeeping, environmental, guard services, engineering, and administrative services. <clears throat> Our IT is mainly procured out of our headquarters and our centers and, and primarily the tech center in Atlantic City and research and development is primarily also done at the tech center. This slide um, gives you some marketing resources um, to do business with the federal with the I'm sorry with the FAA. Um, the first one there you'll see is our procurement forecast. We just posted the forecast for FY22. We um, post on SAM opportunities at 150,000 and above. That's our posting threshold. Um, we also have a subcontracting directory, which is a list of our large prime contractors looking for you to help meet their goals as they are large businesses with subcontracting plans. And a host of information can be found on our small business office website um, shown there, um, including events that we are hosting and participating in in the future. If you are an IT um, firm, we also have an IT industry liaison whose contact information is here, or you can reach out to me for additional um, contact information and a fact sheet on the IT industry liaison program. And here is my contact information. Um, you can reach out to me best also by email um, to request a capabilities briefing um, to discuss um, any questions you might have. So with that, I'll turn it back to, to you, um, Valerie, or actually next up. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark King. I am a customer service director for GSA. Um, I am uh, the customer service director for East Texas, which is a territory of Austin and Houston and Galveston, Beaumont, College Station, all points in between. I service all the federal agencies in my territory, in fact, I, I, service, as, uh, I service the state and local agencies as well, so, so such as the cities and counties, um, ISDs, colleges. So I have a pretty big territory, a lot of customers in my, my, my region, um, and I basically act as the face to the organization. So I, I go to Johnson Space Center, I go to uh, Fort Hood, Army Futures Command, the VA DeBakey, um, the VA Technology Acquisition Center in Austin, uh, you name it, I am their on-site rep, literally on-site rep. And um, I'm just gonna try one more time to see if I can get this thing to open up. It'd be really helpful if we could just kind of follow along with some slides, but it's just, it's just being really squirrely on me today, so sorry. Um, but, 
I, uh, I, so I represent the federal, uh, the federal Acquisition Services, which is a part of GSA. GSA has two main services that we, uh, that we have. We have the Public Building Service and we have the Federal Acquisition Service. Uh, the Public Building Service is more of the uh, landlords of the federal government. The, they own and operate all the federal buildings and courthouses and border stations. The other side, which is who I represent, is the Federal Acquisition uh, Service. We, uh, we, well, we, we like to say is acquisition is our middle name. So we get involved with uh, trying to make the whole procurement process for the entire federal government more efficient, uh, more cost effective. We try to save the, the federal agency's money. Um, and so that's kind of what we do. We have uh, certain business lines within our service. So we have the multiple board schedules, which is what I'm going to focus on today. Those are those contract vehicles that customer agencies can use uh, that we write with uh, vendor community, with the vendor community. But we also have global supply. We have assisted acquisitions. We have contracting officers for hire. We have the fleet program where we lease out, purchase vehicles directly from the manufacturers and lease them out to our federal customers. Uh, we have personal property. That's where we help our federal agencies get rid of uh, their excess for federal property. Um, and we're also involved in policy. So we set, help set the per diem rates and the regulations for that, as well as the federal acquisition regulations, updating those. So we wear a lot of hats at GSA, but I'm just going to focus on the multiple award schedules uh, today with you guys. Um, again, what I am is the rep for, for my territory. I make sure that the Johnson Space Center, I'm their on-site person, that they know who I am, all the contracting officers and contract specialists. Uh, they can reach out to me and I can help them um, with market research, uh, navigating our websites, uh, using GSA eBuy, Advantage, eLibrary, all the websites that we run. Um, I help them with um, statements of work, providing templates for procurement documents. Uh, I'm basically just a consultant for, for ac when it comes to acquisition and I'm free. So I, I stop by these customer agencies um, as part of their workforce essentially. So that's what I do. Um, so I'm a good person to know. The other part is that I, I engage with the vendor community. I try to build up the, the relationships there. In fact, many of the people here at, on this um, and, and in the audience probably have already worked with me in the past. Um, but if you haven't, please reach out to me. I have some contact information on the slides I can't share, uh, but I will I will share that with uh, Milton and everybody. Um, and there's a lot of resources on that um, on that presentation that you know, you'll be able to to see. But um, uh, that's that's what we do. The reason we do it um, when federal agencies have to spend money, when they have to write contracts, they can either write contracts on their own, or they can use a contract vehicle. GSA creates those vehicles with you. Um, it's a lot of work on the front end, but it checks a lot of boxes. Uh, and so when they go to purchase items have already been checked, they're issuing task orders and delivery orders against an already existing contract versus creating a contract on its own. So um, it's it just streamlines the process. We negotiate uh, based on the fact that we're representing the entire federal government, the largest buying power in the world. So we try to get the pricing as competitive as possible and um, and we save the, the agency's time and money. These contracts are five year contracts with three five year options. So they're 20 year contracts uh, potentially. So all that work you do on the front end, you can really reap the benefits for 20 years. Um, they are ID, IDIQ contracts. Uh, they cover all goods and services, commercial goods and services. So if you have it, we probably have a contract for it. Um, so whether it's uh, temporary services or a professional engineer or buying a refrigerator or portable um, offices, I mean, we, we do everything really commercially. Um, so that's some of the benefits. We also have, as Ida mentioned, we uh, the federal agencies have so small businesses. Um, so we have our small uh, federal agencies have, have small business goals. 85% of our contracts are with small businesses, so we really help our agencies meet their small business goals. Um, they get the credit for it. And uh, one of the benefits to you guys if you get a GSA contract is having that little GSA symbol on your websites, on your booth displays. It really tells the other agencies, hey, this these, this company knows how to navigate federal procurement 
whether it's the websites, uh, sam.gov, that sort of thing. Um, it really is a good marketing tool. And last thing I'll mention is that it exposes your company to more business opportunities. Now you can go on to sam.gov anytime you want and find business opportunities that way. But if you have a GSA contract, we have GSA Advantage, which is our Amazon kind of system, as well as the GSA eBuy system. And that's an online RFQ, RFP tool that um, only people with GSA contracts can see. So it's kind of a, it's on its own. You can't see it if you don't have a GSA contract. So, um, uh, but please reach out to me. I'd love to meet you guys. I'd love to get to know you. I'd love to tell you about GSA and how it can help you grow your business. Um, and, um, and I know a lot of people in, in, in my, at least in my territory, um, those federal agencies. So I look forward to working with you guys. Apologies for the technical glitches. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Monica? Okay, let me see if I can pull this up. <laughs> well, good afternoon, because it's past noon now. My name is Monica Kraft. I'm glad to be here. Milton, it's been a long time, so it's good to see you. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, contracting with the federal government, especially with, with NASA. Now, why this slide, I brought this slide up, and you're probably wondering, why did I bring this slide up? Well, there are three ways to do business with NASA. One, as a prime contractor, you can be a small business prime or you can be a large business prime. Or else, okay, sorry. Or else you can do business with us as a uh, subcontractor. So either one of the three ways are very key in doing business with NASA. These particular contractors are important because these are some of the prime contractors that we do business with. They also represent probably 80 to, in some cases, 90% of our business. So as a small business, you wanna reach out to these companies for opportunities. And they're kind of in order based on the amount of business that we do with these particular companies. Now our top, and you've heard a lot about NAICS codes this, today, so I won't kind of, I won't give you the definition of that because I'm sure you know, but these are the major NAICS codes that we have at NASA Johnson Space Center. These are not all inclusive. We do have, we do provide services under other NAICS codes, but these are kind of the major things that we do because of the fact that we um, are human space flight, we deal with um, building um, space vehicles, et cetera. So a lot of our work is geared toward manufacturing and services. For example, we do a lot of business under manufacturing type codes. So that's like the 33, 23, 12, 33, 64, 14, which is the guided missile and space vehicle manufacturing. Um, we also do a lot of business under engineering services, 54, 13, 30. Uh, one of our big next codes that we do a lot of business with is the 54, 17, 14 research and development. And also a lot, most of our work has something to do with IT or, or something to do with custom design services. So the 54, 15, 12, 54, 15, 11 custom programming services are all um, next codes that we do a lot of business with. Now on our buying office, um, because I'm I'm like um, similar to, um, to Mark the, who spoke about um, GSA, we're kind of like the, the forefront people. We're the individuals that we, I guess you can say we wear several hats. We, we work with the interface with the, the community or industry. We also have our, that, which would be our external customers. We also have our internal customers, which would be procurement, our various buying activities. Within procurement, they have a role also because they are, in their interface is the, is the program offices and their responsibility is to make sure that we get a contract in place for the various procurement offices. Space Station program, for example, is the program that basically handles the International Space Station. And that particular uh, support contract is with uh, Boeing. And so you saw Boeing is probably like the, sec the second largest um, federal um, prime contractor that we do business, I mean, contractor that we do business with. So the International Space Station is support that program office which the manager's Eric Shell supports the space station program. Then we have the lunar and planetary exploration. 
That's our gateway program, which is the Habitation Logistics Outpost, or we, it's better known as HALO, as well as our commercial lunar HALO. The, those services come out of the Lunar and Planetary Exploration Office. Then we have our Institution Procurement Office. That's our center operation. So we have work outside of work that's geared towards um, International Space Station or Lunar Planetary Exploration, we still have to manage and run the actual um, center. So that's where a lot of our work, when we talk about facilities, managing the facilities, the operation of JSC, it comes out of the Institution Procurement Office. Also, that's where we have our Office of Procurement. That's where we have the contracting um, mechanism, our contract closeout, our training, et cetera, comes out of that particular branch. Then there's the operation support port, and that manager is Charles Bell, and they're responsible for flight operations, safety, and mission assurance. Then we have the projects procurement, and that's the area that handles our white sand test facility, our human systems engineering, our EVA spacesuits and hardware. We still can't see my, my slides, I gather. Let's see, and our exploration system, last but not least, handles our Orion program, which is our support, it supports the Orion spacecraft, the Orion main engine, and the Orion production and operations. Now, next slide, I wish you could see, we are small and mighty. We have actual 10 NASA centers. We have Ames Research Center, which is out of Moffett Field, California. And they are the aerospace and space and small spacecraft. That's what they that's what that's their um known they're known for. We have the Armstrong Flight Research Center, which is an atmospheric research and testing area. We have the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They handle the deep space robotics rover and networking. Of course, Johnson Space Center, we have we handle human space flight operations where we train the astronauts. This is we're home of the astronauts. We have the NASA Shared Services Center. This is where we deal a lot of our administrative contracting HR support. We have the Stennis Space Center, which is out of um, Bay City, St. Louis, uh, Mississippi, and they handle the vehicle engine, engine, and engine, excuse me, testing. Marshall Space Flight Center, which handles the space transportation, propulsion, space systems, and science out of Huntsville, Alabama. Kennedy Space Center. This is where our launches take place, and they're, they're, they deal with the space vehicle launching and also the landing out of Florida. The Langley Research is one of our smaller centers. They handle the aviation and space research. Goddess Space Flight, which is another large center like, like Johnson, they handle the science missions and telescopes out of Greenbelt, Maryland. And last but not least, Glenn Research Center, which handles the aeronautics and space technology out of Cleveland, Ohio. A lot of the smaller centers do, I guess, a larger portion of the small business um, work. We do, of course, a lot of the work with our work is mostly done a lot of it with our prime contractors, but there are many opportunities as a subcontractor under the contracts with them. We do have some small business contracts. So definitely, I want you to know that. But the majority of our work is done under a prime contractor, at least 80 percent of it. Now, my next slide has a list of all of the small business specials, our contact information. I guess I'll have to just send this to you, Milton, so you can get this so everybody can see this. I'm really, I'm, I'm sorry that you can't see my slides. And one of the ways of making the connection is um, a courtesy visit. Um, once you, we've completed this um, presentation today, uh, this outreach event, the next step would be to contact our office for a one-on-one -on -one meeting where you can talk with one of the small business specialists. We normally, uh, everything's virtual, of course, because we're not in the office. And that's a good way of you of, of introducing ourselves and we get to talk and we get a better feel for your company and what your needs are. We also have joint counseling sessions, which is a combination of our prime contractors that were mentioned earlier, along with SBA. And also the small business specialists will be involved and we'll talk to you and kind of give you an idea of where the opportunities are within the various prime contractors. And of course, outreach events. 
those outreach events can be, actually you can see those under our OSBP website and I'll give you what that is. It's www.osbp.nasa.gov. That way you can keep in contact with us. You can find out about um, OSBP learning series, webinars, uh, various small business outreach events, and we have numerous ones. This is a really um, busy time of the year because we do a lot of outreach at this point of time. And social media can follow us on social media. And that's all I have. And I again apologize that you couldn't see my slides either. And I guess I'll pass on to the next person. Thank you again for your attention. Yes, Kay's coming on via the telephone. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. I uh, want to thank you for inviting me to be part of this. It's a real honor and a real pleasure to um, be a part of this community and this opportunity to share information about the Army Corps of Engineers Galveston District. Uh, let's see. Please let me know when my slides are viewable and then we'll get started. They are. We're at the introductory slide. Alrighty. Okay, perfect. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, this is just kind of a roadmap of what we'll cover today. And some of the other information that has been um, shared from others um, is excellent information that also applies for doing business with the Army Corps. Uh, let's go ahead and jump to the next slide so we can see the overview of what the Galveston District looks like. It covers an immense area, uh, the Gulf Coast line all along Texas, all the way up there into Louisiana. Uh, lots of water projects, but also inland. Um, I don't know if, if you knew, you, you may well know much more of this than I do, but the Texas ports and waterways handled over 700 metric tons of cargo in a year. And I realize right now, apparently there's a lot of ships just kind of waiting, but that's a whole lot of cargo that comes and goes into Texas. Let's see, we've got several ports um, as well as all sorts of other projects. Uh, let's go ahead and jump down to the next slide. As you can see, we do navigation, flood risk, restoration, shoreline protection, there's regulatory and also emergency management. Okay, let's jump on down to the next slide. This is the top 10. So if your specialty or your business's specialty is in one of these NAICS codes, you can see approximately how much we spent in FY21 in that NAICS code. Now, Galveston District does do additional uh, work beyond these NAICS, but as you can see, I took this chart down to about 200,000. So any additional work is going to be significantly less. If you're interested in all the NAICS codes, I will help you, um, I'll help give you the information you need to find out a little bit more. So, I'm, I'm sure that many people in the audience are very well aware of what DODACs are. I'll give you just a moment to read how DODACs were created, because I think Dilbert always has the, the idea right. Okay, let's go on to the next slide here. The DODACs are actually the activity address code. That's gonna be the most important thing for your business to know to try to find opportunities, to f try to find out what different organizations, agencies are buying, what they are soliciting, and more. So in contract speak, for the Galveston District, this is the series of digits that you want to have in your, um, in your memory, in your notes, any time you want to take a look at what Galveston is doing, you can even type in a Google search of you know, W912HY. And then if you put in 22, that will stand for the fiscal year 22. That will help you get the opportunities that have just been posted. If you type in 21, then that will get you last year's opportunities. 
But this information right here is, if you don't take anything else away today, I, I would highly recommend taking this information. This is what you can use from here forward to track what Galveston is doing. Okay, let's jump on to the next slide. One thing I want to encourage everyone, and I know it was talked about at the very um, opening of, of the event, have you visited with your local PTAC? PTACs are phenomenal in their knowledge and their access to information and their ability to help you. And they're not going to charge you $1,000 to help you get registered into any of the programs. There may be a charge on some things. Um, sometimes there's charges for trainings, but it's minimal. It's not, it's not like a private company that's trying to make a profit off of you. PTACs are already funded. So please, if you have not yet met with or worked with your PTAC, I highly encourage it. Um, I actually prefer that you have met or business has met with the PTAC before they come to give me a capabilities brief. Because if they've met with their PTAC, I know that they're just about ready to do business with the government. And doing business with the government is not an easy task, as those who have done it already could tell you. It can be very rewarding. It can also be very challenging. OK, let's go to the next slide. This one I call it the five second elevator speech. And this is your business cards. Many years ago, several years ago, I met a wonderful gentleman. And he had the most awesome business card. It had his name on it. But that's about all. And his phone number. And his last name was Kroger. The only problem was he didn't run grocery stores. I honestly don't remember what he did run, but I remember his name. And I remember looking at that card and thinking, oh my goodness, this is an opportunity to share so much information. So take a look at your business card. Make sure you've got a NAICS and a DUNS and information that when you're not there with that business card, that business card can talk for you. Also, just a little. Note, uh, the shiny ones are really nice and cute and pretty and everything. But please, if you're going to use a business card, can you just do regular card stock? Because many of us make little notes, one, you know, different kinds of notes on the card. And it's much easier to write if they're not shiny. OK, we've got a couple of upcoming opportunities. One of the biggest things is the small business conference that will be hosted with uh, the Society of American Military Engineers. It'll be held in Atlanta this year. Now, that's a great opportunity if you're really ready to do business with the government. It's an opportunity to meet all of the Army Corps of Engineers districts. They will all be there, um, as well as a number of other large businesses, small businesses. Um, veterans and Navy are going to be there. I don't recall Air Force, but I think they are as well. It's a great one-stop shop. However, if you're not ready to do business with the government, I might put that on the calendar for another year or two. Uh, do some of your other local work first before you jump into that one. Let's see. Um, yeah, we've got horizontal um, construction opportunities coming up, a big May talk coming up. And we're going to have an industry day. It'll be sometime in the spring of 22. I'm not sure of the exact date yet, but Keep post keep um, keep current on tracking the the NAICS. Or I'm sorry, I can't even talk now. <laughs> the DODAC. We will get it posted and make sure that everyone knows when the industry day is going to be. Okay, the the capability briefings. Let's jump to the next slide. The capability briefings will be conducted by appointment. They'll be virtual for right now. Again, I'd really like to know that you've already met with the PTAC before we do a capabilities brief, but I'm more than willing to try to help you any way I can. So you're welcome to reach out. That is the email. The nice thing about that particular email, that's going to be with the small business office forevermore. Whether I'm here for 10 years or two years, that email address will continue to reach the small business professional. So please feel free to use that email address. And next slide is if you've got any questions, um, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. I look forward to meeting each and every one of you. 
I also have a list of upcoming opportunities. I've provided that to Aaron. I'm not sure um, if I should maybe send it to uh, Milton as well. And that can be provided to anyone who would be interested. Um, thank you again for the opportunity. I really appreciate uh, being able to join with your, your team today. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Kay. Um... <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. I will not be long. I apologize. I received a call from my son's school and he decides to be sick when I'm trying to get on and present. So, you know, with this COVID, I have to, I had to go get him. So I'm here. Give me two seconds. I'm pulling this presentation up. I need to see if you can see it. Yes. Yes. You can. We can. Uh, okay. So um, like Milton um, had already introduced, I am Lakeisha Douglas. I am one of the branch chiefs uh, here in, at the VA here in Houston for NCO 16. Uh, our network covers a wide range of regions, our area. And um, I won't get too in depth into that, but uh, my contact information hopefully will be on some um, pamphlet information. So if you have any questions, after this speedy presentation before you break for your late lunch, then um, just feel free to reach out to me. Okay, things that we purchase, um, we go through this a lot of times. We purchase standard commodities, commercial, pharmaceutical, of course, medical, surgical supplies, perishable substances. Because we have uh, hospitals, we've got dietitian needs or dietary needs. Uh, materials for facility operations, light bulbs, everything, and equipment. Um, it's Equipment is, is imperative because we've been receiving a lot of funding uh, at the end of the year to purchase uh, equipment for the VA and VHA. I say that to say that if we've got a number of contractors on here that are registered to do business with the federal government and you do commodities aspects, just to be on the lookout because there has been an influx of increased equipment buys. Um, I think with the changing in the trends with COVID, it also, they, they require more testing, they require more equipment, more equipment to run the tests. So we are very busy um, purchasing massive commodities. Even my team, which Stanley does services, we picked up a whole commodities team this year uh, to complete uh, those, requirements. Uh, for services, we do standard facility maintenance, preventative uh, maintenance and repair on all equipment, medical and, st and uh, scientific equipment, cleaning, janitorials. We have all of these CBOX and or satellite clinics throughout the Houston area and the various suburbs, outlying areas, and we maintain those on leases and uh, the janitorial needs. Uh, waste disposal, abatement, remediation and all other things that are deemed services that service the facility and or those within our region. We also cover construction, uh, physician support systems, which are medical uh, support services for medical sharing. And then, as I've said, leasing. We do a number of lease property. On top of managing the team, I just finished a lease property build out, which, as Milton was talking about, different opportunities it's a number, it's a lot of opportunities uh, for small businesses to get subcontracted with these general contractors when we do our lease build out spaces. So I don't know if people ever think about that, but if ever you see anything out there for leasing, it is an opportunity for small businesses uh, to um, work with uh, some of these lessors as their GCs to build out spaces on behalf of the government. Okay, these are our standard business uh, opportunity uh, percentiles that we have to, uh, our targets, excuse me. So we try to meet these uh, standards. We have exceeded them this year. I don't wanna say thanks to COVID, but thanks to COVID. So we have far exceeded our commitment to the small business, the service disabled veteran owned community. Um, our numbers are historically high. They're lower every year for the women-owned small business, for the historically underutilized businesses and small disadvantaged. And that's because of this rule of two at the top. 
Um, the rule of two was a congressional, as a um, Supreme Court decision that ensures that the VA attempts to procure services from a veteran-owned small business first. And what that means is, is that if the contracting officer or the um, awarding office deems or reasonably deems that there will be at least two veteran-owned small business respondents, then we have to set it aside to where only veteran-owned small businesses can bid first. It doesn't mean that they'll win. It doesn't mean that they'll be responsive bids, but we have to give them the opportunity first. And then if those aren't responsive, we go down to small business and open it up. So this is the, mo forget everything else you, you didn't see. It's okay, it was just numbers. But this one, if you're gonna screenshot anything, please do that and jot these down. These are the imperative links to help you do business with the federal government. Um, all companies have to have a SAMS registration. Uh, if you're a veteran owned business, you have to be certified. You can't just state that you're a veteran owned business. You can't just provide your ID card or your discharge paperwork. You have to be verified and certified by the government as a, uh, a veteran owned small business. That process is finalized through the small business um, or through the SBA. Uh, everything that we solicit is on beta.sam.gov. So all procurements that we advertise is on, they're on beta.sam.gov. Um, oh, visit to search RFI sources sought. So we'll post anything out there. We'll post sources sought to gain market research. We'll post our intents to sole source, meaning if we're going to give it to one contract or one contractor without competition, we have to tell the world that we intend to do so. That also gives contractors an opportunity to say, hey, their ABC is not the only business that can do that. I'm XYZ, I can do this as well. And then I might have ZQX come in as well. So if we have people who counter the sole source intent, then we have to do additional market research and we are not authorized to sole source. We have to compete it. Just know that the government requires or encourages competition first. So we like to compete versus just give a sole source to um, somebody. We like to just be fair and open in the market. Um, I always have PTAC on here because a lot of times they can help small businesses get registered and it helps keep them informed. My office isn't the best or we don't have the resources to support small business uh, with regards to the full registration. So uh, PTAC is, is a, a good resource that we refer. And then we always forecast our opportunities, meaning we receive cold calls often and say, you know, we're better or Business will ask, do you have anything, you know, up and coming? Do you have this? Well, we can't divulge that being federal employees because it gives unfair advantage. But we legally have to forecast what our opportunities of procurement are on a public website. And this is the website where you can see upcoming opportunities. OK, guys, I'm going to switch this slide. Let's see if it works. Did it work? Sure did. OK, related websites. So here are a plethora of websites um, outside of what I've given you there at the top. Um, I have the NAICS code on here, which is so so I don't it, it'll benefit you when you're registering your business because the NAICS codes identify what type of business you um, are specifying to do or that you're setting yourself aside to do uh, your classification, your business size. The one thing that uh, Milton asked me to discuss is just the trends that are occurring. And I'd like to just, um, I know COVID has impacted everybody, but I do want to mention now that there is a shortage of, um, just like there's a shortage of, of, of personnel to work in the uh, civilian world, it's a shortage of contractors out here for us. So there's a lot of opportunities for contractors in the federal government to bid and win on these bids with fair and reasonable um, uh, submittals. Uh, I say that because um, a lot of the businesses serving us currently are overwhelmed and overbooked. Um, but there's also a lot of constraints that have been implemented uh, due to COVID. So since the VA, VA nationwide 
uh, we service patients. So contractors now have to consider the COVID testing. They have to consider providing proof every time you have staff enter the facility. Uh, we're all aware that Biden has um, passed the um, executive order to have all federal employees or mandate that we are to be vaccinated uh, or have a an, you know medical or religion uh, excuse or exemption. Outside of those exemptions, contractors must comply as well if you're entering federal property, especially when there's patients involved. So those are added expenditures to the bids. We're having to go back now and revise a number of contracts because of that. But um, I missed a lot of other presentations, but I'm sure that everybody's aware that that is a major trendsetter at this point. So um, there's a shortage of solid contractors out here for us right now. I think that's wonderful for those who are attending uh, this conference to know. So if you have not registered for to do business with the federal government, uh, not just the VA, all agencies of the federal government, I would suggest you go out and do that. Be registered at the federal level, the state level, and the city level, um, and, and bid away. I think that that is all I've got for you all. So we, I have, we have an SBA liaison, um, Pamela Travis. Here's her information if you have questions about just small business. She, if she can't answer them, she'll refer you to SBA. Uh, my point of contact was on the first slide. And I think it will be on the literature that is passed out as well. You guys, I don't respond back to everything. So, um, you don't have to, please don't ask me about bids, but anything that I can do to support you and give you direction uh, to get properly registered, um, I am willing to do so. So I thank you for your time and I, your patience. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tony Arps and I'm the uh, project director with the USD Department of Transportation Small Business Transportation Resource Center. We're one of 11 centers throughout the country. Uh, Milton has given me this monumental task of uh, letting you know how to get procurement opportunities through the Department of Transportation. But it all starts with knowing where the money comes from. Is my first slide up there? Can you guys see that? Yes, sir. Okay. Just to talk about our objectives, just two things I want to mention on this slide, really. We advocate for small businesses, and but most of the people that are on this webinar, what you're looking for is what are opportunities out there with government agencies. And so what we do also is assist in seeking procurement opportunities. Congress appropriates funding to USD, OT, and operating oper operations to provide funding to invest in transportation infrastructure, safety innovations throughout the country. So this is where it all starts. It all starts with Congress, and I know many of you have been watching the news. It starts with Congress deciding on appropriating funding to the different government agencies. In this case, I'm talking about USDOT. USDOT has nine administrations, and I'm gonna to wanna to talk about four of them right now, uh, but there's an, as many as nine. Many of you are, are aware of these, uh, administrations, there's the Federal Aviation, there's Federal Highway, Federal Transit, and the Federal Rail Administration. DOT, uh, through these administrations, that's how the money is allocated. Let me start with this one. For example, the Federal Aviation Administration. Most opportunities on Department of Transportation projects, the funding and the procurement of it lies with the different agencies that the different administrations select to do it. For example, Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, when money is allocated and it's allocated to FFA and they decide to uh, allocate this money in this, the Houston area, let's just say George Bush or Hobby Airport, it is that re their responsibility to, uh, they're the ones that's managing the projects, getting the contractors to do the work. For example, if FFA gives a, 
uh, throughout, you know, there's tens of billions of dollars that's out there to be spent on transportation infrastructure. So if FAA has money that they have been given, uh, they're going to give it through grants. So Hobby Airport or uh, Houston Intercontinental, they could get an airport improvement program grant. And that also goes with uh, the other different, um, different uh, airports, the smaller airports as well. Federal Highway, uh, Tech Dot, different municipalities, City of Houston, uh, Harris County, the Council of Governments. Uh, many times I'm at a uh, outreach event and someone asked me, well, how do I get work with uh, the Department of Transportation? I know they're building uh, the Grand Parkway. How do I get on that project with DOT? Well, it all starts with the money from Federal Highway. TxDOT gets a grant and then TxDOT is in charge of getting that project completed. So they go out and they get a prime contractor like a Zachary or Williams Brothers, and that's where the procurement opportunity comes from. And as you see here, uh, this is the transit. So that's the FTA. Then you have a, a roadway there. Federal Highway could be funding some of that. Now, I told you about how the money travels down, and now you're probably asking, well, I know the money travels down to the city of Houston and it travels to Houston Metro, how do I find out about the opportunities? I only have one entity here on my screen here. This is just an example of where to go to find out about the opportunities. For example, if Federal Highway or if there are money allocated to the city of Houston, city of Houston has a city of office business, business opportunity, okay? So that office, that would be the first place I go and they could assist you in how to go about getting a, a, an opportunity. Maybe it's a city street that has federal dollars on it. It could be uh, with public works. Or let's just say it was a transit project. You knew of a transit project. Uh, the transit agency, they all have a small business office. TxDOT has a small business office. So that's where you would go to find out about these different projects. Once you know the money's there, that's when you go to them to find out about the projects. Usually most of them have a website, so you could probably go on the TxDOT website, go on contracting, and it could, it will tell you the different projects in the area that you would like to work in, and you would start from there. Also, various uh, prime contractors that they've selected to do the work, they are uh, they have different outreach. Uh, earlier, there was a I think that was a private. Uh, private contract. There was an outreach project that an outreach event for a project that's that's taking place there in Houston, and they have a uh, a networker or an opp opportunity meeting tomorrow. So again, Congress allocates the money to DOT and the operating administrations. Operating administrations being uh, Federal Aviation, Federal Highway, Federal Transit. These administrations then. Once the money is allocated through grants to, for example, the city of Houston or to the Hobby Airport, they then are in charge of procuring all the different services that are needed to complete that project, be it uh, the prime contractor and then that prime contract to get subcontractors to do the work. So again, there's tens of billions of dollars that's projected to come with the next spending bill from DOT. It will all be going to the administrations and that administration would be, be allocating that money through various grants to the different agencies like your TxDOT, your city of Houston, uh, the Houston airport, and all the different agencies throughout the country. And I like to say that money is allocated in a number of different ways. For example, the city of Houston, they may get money through Federal Highway, they get money through different other sources. So all the projects that are out there, it all starts with those agencies that receive federal funding to find out where the projects. So I think that was more important. Uh, Milton, I hope I, I, I was, uh, what I had to say was informative to the audience out there because it really starts with where the money comes from and how it's filtered down. Once you know how it filters down and you know whose hands the money is in, that's where you'll find the opportunity. And again, I was uh, thankful for the opportunity to be on this webinar.
thank you, Tony. <laughs> Tim? I think I don't believe uh, we've had uh, the VA had um, a conflict. So Tim, you're up to, to end the panel. I see Tim online, but he's currently muted. So we'll just wait a moment and see if his audio is unmuted. There yeah. we go. Welcome, Thank you very much for your patience. I had a call come in I had to take real quick. I apologize for the delay. Give me just one second to set up my presentation, please. OK, you should be looking at my presentation right now, correct? Not yet. We'll give it a second to load, just a moment. And just to be sure, would you share it out one more time, just to make sure we have it? Thank you, sir. How about now? We have it. We've had gremlins all morning, but yours has come through. So <laughs> we're thankful for that. That's it and go into full view. OK, so good afternoon, everybody. And again, I appreciate your patience. And I apologize for a little bit of delay there. I'm Tim Scarborough. I'm with the University of Houston Procurement Technical Assistance Center. And what I would like to share with you today is some information about how our program can help you sell your goods and services, not only to federal government, but as you've heard today, local and state government as well. And jumping right into it, how do we help you do this? Well, we offer two core services. We have our client advising services and our training services. And you'll see highlighted in blue there that all of our services are no cost to you. We're funded through the Department of Defense partially as well as the state of Texas and it's a combination of the funding from those two entities that allow us to provide our services at no cost. Looking at the client advising services, we do require that you have an application with us before we can meet with you. These are the 101 services we provide individuals to help them understand and to position them to sell their goods and services to federal, state, and local government. And when I say goods and services and services specifically, I also include construction. You'll also see that we also provide assistance for the small business innovation research and small business technology transfer contracts and grants programs. SBIR and STTR are those programs with the federal government for research and development, new technologies to bring things to the commercial market that you cannot find on the commercial market right now. We primarily assist with government contracts. We do have one exception for grants and that is related to the SBIR and the SBTTR programs. So if you're pursuing grants outside of those two programs, let's say a local government grant, a state grant, or even an, another federal government grant, our program terms and conditions with the Department of Defense do not allow us to provide that assistance. So the vast majority of our clients that we work with, we help them pursue government contracts. Now our program is for companies with a history of sales. So we do have a minimum sales requirement of $10,000 over the last two years. We used to have it as 10K over the last year, but with COVID and the impact that it's had in the business industry, we've expanded that out, making it just a little bit easier for you to meet the threshold to become eligible for our program. So if you do exceed that, uh, if you have at least that amount of sales or greater, then you would be eligible for our program services. Now, we do have two exceptions to the minimum sales requirement. In other words, you don't have to have any sales at all if you fall within the exception. And one of them is the SBIR and STTR program. So if you are in the research and development, new te technologies area, and you find that SBIR and STTR is an area of interest for you, 
then it is an exception to the minimum sales requirement. The second exception is for the federal government hub zone. I think I heard Valerie say earlier, hub zone, not to be confused with the state of Texas hub. They do share the same acronym, historically unutilized business, but the hub zone is specifically for the federal government. And if, you, if your principal place of business is located in a hub zone, then that does meet one of the exceptions for the minimum sales requirement. And as I've covered already, we do require an online application before we can meet with you. And I'll share with you in a few minutes where you can find our application if you're interested in submitting one. Training, this is no cost webinars and workshops. We do a variety of training in government procurement subjects at local, state, and federal government. You do not have to be a client. You do not have to meet any minimum sales requirement. You don't have to be in business. Anyone can attend to participate in our training that is made available on our website. We have a calendar out there that you can access under training and events link. You select it, it brings up our calendar. We have it posted out there for a couple of months at time. You select the event you want to participate in. It'll bring you to our registration page. And as I said earlier, all of our training and webinars are no cost to you. Some of the specific services we provide, provide you've heard of about a few of them here today, registrations, you know, the system for award management, the SBA dynamic small business search system with the state of Texas, you have the centralized master bidders list, and then when you get down to local government, it can be a whole host of registrations depending on, on who you want to do business with. We help you navigate those. We help you get positioned to complete the registrations because there's some preliminary things you're going to have to do before you're ready to get registered. For example, do you know how to select your next code, North American Industry Classification System codes? Are you familiar with NIGP codes, National Institute of Governmental Purchasing codes? Those are the two primary industry coding systems used by government agencies, and we help you understand how to select them so you can position yourself for registration so you can get them in your registrations to get on their vendor database. We also provide assistance with certifications. Those are the socio and economically disadvantaged small business programs for minorities, women, persons with disabilities, which also includes service disabled veteran or small businesses. If there are any veterans out there listening today, I just want to take a second to thank you for your services. We also help you with locating opportunities. That consists of two core areas. That's where government agencies post the solicitations. What websites do you have to go to to register with in order to get notified of opportunities in your, in your email? The second aspect of that is talking to you about how to be proactive, how to go out and market your business to government agencies. So you have the reactive response, which is responding to the emails that come to you, which you need to do. Those are opportunities you can bid on, but you also have the proactive measure, which is going out, understanding the agencies that buy your goods and services. Equally important, understanding how they buy your goods and services, and then we give you some recommendations and some suggestions on how to develop a marketing strategy to reach out to them. Solicitation review. This is really the pinnacle of our program. Everything else I've gone over with you is educating and guiding you, getting you ready to do business with government because you want to get to the point where you are getting those email notices in your basket, in your email uh, inbox, or you've made contact with a government agency and they pointed you to an opportunity that you're interested in. So when you find a solicitation, your advisor will sit down with you, review it, help you make that initial bid, no bid decision, and if you decide you want to bid on it, then your advisor is there to review it with you to help answer questions to make sure you understand the instructions for submitting the compliant offer and also understanding the evaluation criteria, how they're going to evaluate you in contract award selection. So we offer a variety of services. This is just a few of them here that I wanted to highlight for you. What's important for you to know is that when you think of government procurement with local, state and federal, Think of PTAC because that's who we are and what we do and our responsibility is to educate and guide you and get you positioned to do business with government and hopefully succeed in winning government contracts. So how do we pull it all together for you? 
we call our program the three R's of government contracting. So once you become a client of UHP TAC, we take you through a logical process from point A to point B to get you ready to do business with government. Now this model here applies to federal, state, and local government. The steps in each will be different, but the model is still the same. And regardless of what your experience is, we can insert you into this model and move forward. You have the registration phase. That's the first step. If you're going to do business with any government agency, you're going to have to be registered. Get on their vendor database. If you're eligible for the certification programs, we start discussing those with you early on during the registration phase so you can pursue those as well. Those often happen in parallel, okay, because they're their own process that can take anywhere up to a couple of months to several months to get you certified. And as you were informed earlier, you do not have to be certified in order to continue to pursue government opportunities. But certainly if you are eligible for those certifications, you want to take advantage of them because they can help improve your chances of winning government prime contracts or subcontract opportunities. Once we get you through the registration phase, then we move on to the research phase. And that's what I talked about earlier, knowing where to locate the opportunities, developing that government marketing plan, and then finally we move to the respond phase. And that's when we sit down with you, you've located the solicitation, you think it might be for you or you know it's for you, and we help you understand how to submit a compliant offer and understand the evaluation criteria that's going to be used to evaluate the offer that you submit. Taking you through this process does normally take a series of meetings through the basic fundamentals, and there are a wide variety of subjects that encompass government contracting, and depending on your needs and what we recommend to you, there are quite a few things that we could be discussing with you, but generally speaking, to get through the baseline services that I've laid out here for you, our goal is to have you receiving opportunity notices within two to three meetings assuming that there are government opportunities that are being advertised at the time that we meet with you. How do you become a client of the PTAC? You visit our website. There's a link up in the top right that says request advising. Once you select that, it'll ask you to put your email address in and then we have a questionnaire they'll ask you to fill out. The questionnaire just helps us better understand who you are, what your business is, what you want to sell the government, but we also use it to help us prepare to meet with you for the initial meeting. Once the application comes in, you're assigned an advisor. The advisor will contact you. You and the advisor work together to set a date that is uh, amenable to both of you. And then the initial meeting is set and we begin the process with you. That concludes my presentation today. I appreciate everybody joining us and thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And thank you, everybody on the panel. This was great. A lot of good information. And um, Milton, we want to thank you for allowing us to come in um, about this time every year and give information on doing business with the federal government. The more small businesses we have involved, the better it'll be. So thank you very much. Valerie, just just outstanding. Uh, this was a, a great team that we've assembled. Uh, and of course, most of these guys have been in, in the industry and been in with these agencies for a long time. So their commitment is unparalleled when it comes to our minority firms, our 8As, our DBEs, our SDBs, uh, WSBs. I mean, just outstanding. Uh, I can't thank you enough. There was times when I, I was thinking, man, I need to jump in and say a word or two. Uh, but then, you know, sometimes I go, I get so excited. So, Valerie, you've just been great in helping me. And, and certainly what we're going to do is we're going to do a recording, guys, of everything that we've done. We're going to fold in those presentations, like if we missed a little bit of Monica's uh, presentation from NASA, uh, certainly we missed um, Mark King uh, with GSA. Uh, we'll fold their presentations together with, with um, their, their speeches and then actually come up with a nice program that we'll be able to send to all of the attendees. So we really uh, don't feel like you missed uh, too much. We'll have that done probably within in the coming days. <clears throat> I want to 
again, thank everybody who spoke, Tim, uh, for putting a button on everything. Um, you know, PTAC is, was mentioned in several cases. Uh, I think you kind of bring everything together under one roof uh, and make it easy for people to understand. So I think we guys, please, please get with Tim. Tim's a great guy and very committed uh, through PTAC. Uh, with that, I want to thank all of you. And and now, if you would give me give me just a few minutes, guys, because uh, I want to just go over a few announcements. Uh, and I guess what we'll see here is we actually kept some of these announcements on, even though they're dated. Uh, but we, but in the case of a and Texas A&M that you're seeing on the screen now with Bartlett Cox, uh, there, there's a big project that they're doing. I had the pleasure last week to actually go to the, the little meet and greet that they had uh, on the project. They're certainly looking for participation, uh, her participation. Uh, in fact, last week was special because it was diversity and inclusion week and uh it was it was just uh it was laden with uh two or three or four events every day and uh and it kind of continues just a little bit this week uh as we have a few other events including uh uh the ion introduction uh that that um we talked about as you'll see the next one supply diversity day that was with mccarthy uh, McCarthy Building is one of our top GCs uh, in the area. They just finished, guys, the Museum of Fine Arts. It's a, it's a, it's another component to the existing buildings there. Uh, it is a fabulous facility uh, right there at Bissonnette in Maine. If you haven't been to the new Museum of Fine Arts, you've got to go. It, it, it is fabulous. Uh, but McCarthy. Uh, is doing work at the Northeast Water Purification Plan I mentioned earlier. Uh, they're doing work at uh, at Port Houston, at Port, Port Arthur. Uh, they're doing uh, several projects. I mean, they just also finished uh, um, the Holocaust Museum in the Museum District. Uh, so the thing that I, I really like in that diversity meeting that we had, Jim Stevens, the president, uh, has always iterated that he wants at minimum 15% minority participation on any project that they have, whether it's whether it's a uh, government uh, or, or private sector, as is the case uh, with with the projects that I mentioned, the Holocaust, the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, they were seeking participation goals. Period. Even though those are private private uh, uh, projects. Next. Next slide. Uh, we just heard earlier uh, at the start from NAMAC. This is just a reiteration of um, NAMAC's day of the construction worker that Abel uh, talked about. And NAMAC, of course, is doing a great job uh, in bringing opportunities to the community from a number of different venues every month. They've been most active as much as any other organization out here. So we thank, thank Abel and uh, uh, people like Roger Pombro, who's the president, uh, for doing just a fantastic job. And of course, that was a great event. Next. Uh, we just heard from Andrea Odom uh, with, um, of course, uh, the whole ION district. Uh, which is a uh, which is one that we all want to attend. It's not too late to register. Uh, I'm going to be there. I, I think we should all be there. We're talking about 15 million dollars still in project dollars, over 20 project opportunities, and there's several listed in landscaping, structural steel, rough carpentry, waterproofing, and the like. Uh, please, guys, try to attend. And that's a beautiful facility. If you're familiar. That's at Old Sears right there at Maine, at Wheeler, between Maine and Fadden, and at Wheeler. Uh, so we're really excited about what's going there. Rice University has taken a lead role. They actually owned a lot of that property there. Uh, and of course, you know, the Fiesta, if you're, you're familiar with the area, right across the street. So they have folded a lot of the property that they own. And, and, and of course, that whole corridor 
is to address, uh, I think we, we were maybe 30th in innovation and technology in this city. Uh, so we're, we're trying to make sure that we increase our capacity, our knowledge, uh, and improve this. As you saw, the mayor was on Andrea's video. So I'm, I'm talking a lot about, about this particular project. Uh, Gilbane Construction is one of our top GCs that's on the project. So please try to attend. It's not too late. Next. Uh, you know, we heard from Jerry Bird. Uh, Jerry did an outstanding job from the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, Tony Arps from uh, the USDOT and the work that he's doing there. Well, this particular project with Hensel Phelps is a city of Houston airport project. It's a $374 million project with, with one of the main um, components of the project bidding on the 28th. Uh, so I was going to have them here this morning. They, said, they called me just now and said, Milk, we're trying to get people signed up. We're trying to encourage uh, MWBEs to participate. There's a, I think there's a 15% goal for M MBEs and a 5% goal for women in business. Uh, so they're really pushing and trying hard to meet that goal. Again, a $374 million project with a major component bidding this Thursday, the 28th. So guys, if you haven't put your bid in, we've got to bid Hensel. Hensel Phelps has been one of our top GCs. Uh, we've had a lot of success. We've recognized them for all the work that they've done uh, in the minority business hub, hub of uh, business communities. Next. Manhattan Construction, again, one of our top GCs in the Houston area, in Texas and in the country, as far as I'm concerned. They built everything. I mean, uh, the University of Houston, they, they built the Ovacious Football Stadium, uh, NRG, uh, in 2004. Uh, they built the Cowboys Stadium. They built the Texas Rangers Baseball Stadium just a couple of years ago. Um, the Dynamo Stadium. Uh, and, 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 and of course, Metro's, uh, I say new facility has been there for a while now and Maine uh, at Pierce. Um, so just a lot of projects. I, I can go on and on with Manhattan, uh, but this is a project that they're really focusing on. Uh, the pre-bid invitation, as you see, uh, those dates on Thursday, November 4th, and, and of course, again, on the 13th. Uh, it's in Dallas, so it's a Dallas College project. They're doing work in Dallas. So those of us who have the capacity to go to Dallas to do some work there, then I would suggest strongly that we go. They're looking for participation in all those areas as you see it, you know, painting, drywall, uh, first clean, fencing. I mean, there's a, I mean, uh, it covers a spectrum of construction opportunities and the like. So please, please stay close to this particular project. And uh, of course, Lael Ellis has been one of our key contacts. She heads up our diversity uh, piece here in the Houston area. Next. That's Lael's information. DRC uh, is an environmental firm. Uh, of course, they have made several presentations, but when it comes to disasters, uh, they have been one of, uh, I think we have six companies that we've contracted with through the city so that when we have another Hurricane Harvey, for instance, that we're not scrambling to find a GC that can do uh, restoration or repair, that these companies are already set up to move quickly to do work in the area of, of uh, repair, uh, renovate and, and in the case of a disaster. Uh, I know that DRC was doing a lot of work just recently in Baton Rouge in New Orleans after the storm we had there. Uh, and so we definitely want to get in touch with them. Uh, they're, they're, they're a very strong company and they've sent uh, attached there or their vendor files, their vendor profile form. So you want to get on their vendor profile system in order to do business with DRC. Next. Uh, County Commissioner Rodney Ellis is uh, heads up Precinct 1. Uh, you see several, uh, he has several programs going. He's been very, very active in Precinct 1, as, as has all the uh, commissioners 
through precinct four, two, three, and four, um, the county judge uh, in uh, Lena Hidalgo. Uh, they've come up with an MWBE program. I think we got that started back in February. Uh, I think in April or May, I actually had Harris County to come in and talk about all of the opportunities that they have. Um, and um, and they're really, really pushing hard. We've got several Harris County projects out there. Manhattan that I mentioned has several. Uh, so please keep up with what's going on with Harris County. There, there's a lot. Of, I mean, Harris County is the third largest uh, county in the United States with a diverse set of opportunities. So please keep up with that space. Next. Uh, Metro who has been just a great partner over the years, is in the midst uh, of, of their Metro Next program, which is a, a huge expansion of all the railways and rail lines, uh, uh, the areas where we, you know, our seated areas, people where we're waiting on bus stops and all. Uh, but we're fortunate just tomorrow, uh, as we continue, it seems like with Diversity Week or weeks, uh, they have sure can't. Uh, ready, uh, the Metro's Executive Vice President of Planning, Engineering, Construction. You can RSVP to hear him talk about all of the upcoming opportunities and included there will be uh, in that little outline that we have is all of the upcoming uh, meetings that that Metro has. We've got to stay in that space. That amount of money that we're talking about is $7.65 billion of new work coming up over the next 10 years or, or better. So please, let's keep up with Metro. Next, and that's, okay, cool. continue. Okay, we just talked about Harris County uh, and all the work that they have. Skanska USA building, Tiffany, Tiffany has been uh, just uh, great uh, in, in her work. Uh, with um, with Harris County. Uh, that's a toll road project that she has upcoming. But you just heard from Tiffany last last week, uh, last month, I guess, uh, when we uh, brought uh, some of the colleges and institutions. Uh, they have a major project out at Texas A&M uh, at the Mays Business School. We're doing a huge renovation at Mays uh, at College Station A&M. Uh, and of course, Skanska has that project. Uh, they had the Zayed Lab for MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, there in the medical center and many, many other projects. I'm always proud because, you know, we've been hosting the forum at HCC, Houston Community College, West Loops campus. And right there next to the campus, uh, Skanska built a, a brand new garage. You know, that's an evening, a night school. And so they built a new garage, three stories. And uh, we actually had a minority firm that I know that, that did all the lighting. And that was Roger Pombro, uh, Emerald Standard Electric. So Roger continues to work hard and do good work that, that kind of opens the way for others to follow in the minority business community. So we thank Tiffany and Skanska for all the great work. And of course, uh, we talk about um, football stadiums. Along with Manhattan, they build on NRG, uh, and actually uh, they build previous football stadium as well. Next, we've got a section called highlighting small business, and so we always like to recognize some of our small businesses that have been very, very active in the community, and certainly, guys, uh, as we talk about the federal government and others, these are people that are capable that are looking for opportunities. I mean, you just heard from Impact Strategic Consulting, and, and coincidentally, here's the first slide, uh, the work that they've done, and not just COVID, uh, but in case of disasters like Hurricane Harvey uh, in mitigation, uh, they do just a, a ton of work when it comes to disaster relief. And of course, now working closely with, with the ION District. Next. Uh, East Houston Hospital has three hospitals. Uh, Ruben Shaw has his phone number there. Uh, they've been involved a lot in COVID testing. Uh, they, I think they're doing administering some of the uh, vaccines now. Uh, they have a little meeting schedule on Thursday. I'll be attending that. 
so that we'll be able to update you on some of the things they've been doing of, of late. I know breast cancer awareness and work there. Uh, they've, they've just been an outstanding group that continues to expand their efforts in the small and minority business communities. And we thank Ruben for that work. Next. Okay. National Urban Construction uh, is a commercial and residential restoration and cleanup uh, services. I know they've done work at Prairie View in terms of fogging and getting all those buildings ready when we started school. Uh, they've done work at the University of Houston, some off-campus housing uh, in, in some of the areas you, you see there. Uh, and of course, they continue to be a bright spot. I know I just spoke to them the other day. They're doing a, a lot of work out uh, at Griggs and MLK. We're doing a, a lot of re restorations. We're building new apartments and all. Right there with uh, Houston Business Development Inc. and Cadence Bank right there at Griggs and MLK. Uh, they have a nice project and certainly they would be one to contact because I'm sure that they're looking for assistance in participation and of course, you see uh, their number there. Michael Sal is, uh, along with Don Sal, uh, have been just great, great partners of the community, and we thank them. Next, Navarro Insurance. Sam Pineda uh, is an institution of, of in, in himself. Uh, he has just done some outstanding work in the community. Uh, and, and working and trying to encourage people and, and minority firms to higher heights. Uh, but of course, working through Navarro Insurance Group has just done a ton of uh, services in the medical fields, as you see, medical insurance, uh, life, ad and disability, dental, vision, long-term care, 401ks, all of those are their offerings. And of course, Navarro Insurance has been in business some 25 years. If you're looking for any support in those particular areas, please, please don't hesitate to call Sam Pineda and you can see his cell. He'll tell you, call me on my cell. And, uh, and you see his cell number down there, 713-256-9517, Sam. Thank you for all the work you do in the community. Maribel uh, Rodriguez, another key, key person in the community. She has her own uh, workshops and training sessions. She does a lot of labor, uh, labor personnel in those particular areas. You see office professional, industrial, maintenance, hospitalities, transportation, construction. Uh, she does a lot and brings a lot of capable people to the table. We're always now in these days lacking personnel. Uh, you know, staffing is low as you can see. Um, you know, uh, there's a number of areas where we're just we're just lacking labor uh, in these days. So Maribel has really done a fine job in filling those voids. So we thank her so much for all the work in the community and of course, certainly in supplying capable personnel. Next, NAMAC, we've already heard from. Uh, that's their banner. Uh, and of course, I know you'll be hearing again from ABLE when they have their upcoming events. Next. Labor Now is another, uh, but a disaster relief staffing service in particular. And you can see some of the areas, mold, mold removal, hazmat, uh, biohazard, fire and smoke, water loss, uh, disaster relief in general. Um, you know, they've just done a, a fine job in, in responding uh, to some of the, the, the critical, critical problems that we've had with, with hurricanes, uh, you know, the storm, the ice storm that we had back in February. Uh, so very responsive and that's the kind of people that we look at. We know that we can always count on labor now. So we thank them for all their efforts. Next. And of course, uh, this is, you know, from an educational and inspirational uh, the Red Cross always continues to call us. Uh, they offer information on COVID-19. Uh, they're always updating us on new things that we need to know about COVID. Uh, and certainly in adhering to hurricanes uh, and disasters in that, in that vein, uh, they always are there. Uh, they always give us information. 
So uh, with that, we again salute uh, the Red Cross for their efforts in giving us this key information. And of course, guys, remember, we're still in hurricane season. Uh, that technically uh, goes all the way into November. With that, I want to thank all of our sponsors. We, we, we've we got a great, great group of sponsors, many of them not only are sponsors and strategic partners, but they actually participate in each event. And, you know, I see uh, some of the banks there in this next, next forum uh, that's scheduled for November 16th is going to be doing business with our financial institutions during these critical times, how to get financing, uh, so I certainly want you guys to attend that. You'll be hearing from us on that in in in. Uh, but again, some of the key sponsors that we've had over the year, uh, we're very proud and very thankful for all of their participation. Uh, without them, uh, it would be no us. And without without opportunities, uh, it's hard for our community to function. And these guys bring the opportunities. And I, you know, as you look in closing, just last just last uh, month, you know, it was doing business with our educational institutions. So look how we closed, you know, with Sam Houston, with Lone Star College, HCC, Fort Bend ISD, you know, though University of Houston at the top, all of those folks participated in our last forum. And, and we're just and, and provided great, great information. Thank you guys so much for all that you gave today. It was just outstanding. And uh, for the attendees, be on the lookout for our next forum webinar, which is going to be on November 16th. And that is financing your business uh, in, in times of, uh, of uncertainty. OK. So we'll see you guys then. And again, thank you all so much for attending. Take care. Be safe.